Regenerative agriculture is intentional. People intentionally get up knowing what they're doing today and they know what they're doing to enhance their ecosystem processes. So their water cycle, their mineral cycle, their energy flow, they're trying to capture as much sunlight as possible and they're also trying to increase biodiversity. Yep. So if we've got those four functions being enhanced, then we're really starting to move and there is an intention because we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Well, I don't know anyone who has started down this path of doing things differently that's stopped doing it. Yep. You know, they just keep, they get excited about it. I had a, a, a 80 year old client the other day tell me with tears in his eyes that you know, he loves farming again. He was going to sell up and finish up, but you now he doesn't want to. The technology should be solving root causes and, and not damaging soil structure. Yep. And so technologies that disturb and bear ground are actually, you know, to, to a big degree. Yep. Um, you know, yes, you can put your tines in and plant. Yes, you can yeah, do yeah, your, yeah. you know, yeoman's plough and those things. But those aren't lifting and turning. They are simply aerating, lifting and li yep. dropping back down. They're actually pro providing aeration. You've got living organisms, so yep. we bring in the cropping, we bring in the integrated pest management, we bring in those things that can handle pests and it's a balance between the predator and prey yep. relationship um, in the living organisms. To me, it's very important for us to acknowledge the role of the, of the livestock in really enhancing and making and helping our ecosystem processes function really well. well they're a critical part of it and I love that concept about farming's intentional. Some level of ground cover is critical to to actually mitigate and or manage the extreme, the more extreme weather conditions yep. we might be facing. Yeah, you can see here January to now, um, we're still even though we had a fair bit of rain in January February, yeah, still uh, we're still the second driest mm -hmm. um, in 120 years. Yes, so that's not a bit of catching up to do. Next question I get is how likely is it that we'll get winter rain? So this is for the April to August period. Yeah, eight out of 10 years, we would expect to get at least 140 mils in the next five months. So okay. we'd be pretty cranky if we don't get, you know, five or six inches of rain, so. Yeah, sure, over the winter period. Over the winter mm -hmm. period. Yeah, sure. It's actually really important, I think, for farmers to manage for variable rainfall. Oh, absolutely. And, and, that's, and that to me, as soon as you start taking the rainfall issue out of your management process, then I think you start looking forward rather than wondering. Yeah, yeah. Between October and March, what typically happens, so I asked Climate, how often do we get more than 400 mils um, in the six months over summer? And 69 in the last 120 years, there you are. we've had over 400 mils. But again, you can see over time, there's yeah, plenty of years over, plenty of years well over. Well over, yep, yeah, that's right, yep, that's it. And bringing it back to what's happened in the last seven months yeah. um, here, so uh, starting at the beginning of summer, you can see the long-term trend yep. and obviously it was dry, dry, dry and then we had the rain and now we've got quite a full profile. But the point I wanted to make is that over that seven months, we've had 421 mils of rain, we've only kept 147 in the soil. That, that ground cover conversation is, is key. You know, we're having longer dry periods, yep. so that stops the, you know, minimises evaporation. And then if you've got ground cover, it's like water falling on a sponge, yes. and so it can actually go in. Um, it's not hitting that concrete or that hard dry pan, or, you know, just even bare dirt, which causes the run and the erosion yep. and all those things to happen. Composts and fertilizers and my amendments. And so in the toolbox, these would be considered technology. So those compost teas, anything yep. with biology in them, yes. would be considered um, a, um, a living organism in the toolbox. They're very applicable to the regenerative process. Yep. But there's not too much life in a bag of you know conventional <laughs> synthetic fertilizer. Yes, I know. And then there's the whole management um, aspects of yep. and, and the grazing. Um, yeah, so and actually applying applying the grazing and the tool of grazing um, by 
by moving animals on a plan and graze. So it's not about rotational grazing. It's not uh, time control grazing. It's actually about understanding the the role of grazing um, and the role of recovery. Yeah. So in me needing to ensure that the plants have a chance to recover. I see that all the time, that people come to me wanting to know, you know, is there some nutritional thing? But unless or and until they get their grazing management right, yes. um, it's, they're kind of wasting their time playing around with the other things. So. Well, you've broken the cycle every time yeah. you've moved your animals. So the worms don't feature. There's there's a whole layer of, of issues that just get Seem um, to wiped out completely. because yeah. you're moving animals. Yes, yes, I love that. Um, so there's some more sort of examples. Um, the constructing interventions in the... You know the land landscape. Yeah, um, the rehydrating. Slow, slow. Yeah, rehydrating. Yep, yeah, absolutely. There's so much good information and good work and and examples of people doing doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, these are some really good examples of the types of things that um, regenerative farming involves. Yeah, that's right. We wanted to cover off some of what it may mean for you once you adopt some of these practices and some of the things mm. that you can expect to happen. Yeah. Um, most farmers would be very pleased with the fact that the um, majority of the time leaves an increased productivity, profitability. Yeah, and also I think with that is that in agriculture to date, the best in show has had a lot of kudos. Oh, my yield was this, my you know, winning yields. Yes. However... How much did it cost to get that yield? And I think that's the reality, that's the real question to ask. Yeah. And so often people say, oh, you know, people who, yes, when you move to a regenerative agricultural, you know, process and you start um, direct drilling or you, you know, doing some cover cropping or, or pasture cropping, you may not find that your yield is, or because of the spacing or whatever, the yield may not be as much. However, the cost of actually growing something yeah. has been far less and so your profitability is actually higher. Yeah. And I think this is something that we've got to actually just do the shift on and understand more so that, you know, it's encouraging to, to encourage people to try something different, you know, to actually direct drill into yeah. to existing pasture after it's been grazed and then plant their crop. And, and I said to, um, you know, someone recently, I said, you know, the way we can do it is if we want a diversity of crops, I mean, yes, it can be hard to harvest it yep. that way. I mean, let's solve the problems, not actually say we can't do it because. Yep. yep. The other aspect about yield and profitability is there's a time scale, there's a time frame to it. Like as, as farmers and agronomists are actually quite good at looking at a paddock and working out how to make the most money out of that in the next six months. But um, when you're... When you're looking over a five-year period, it yeah. may be best, you know, one step back for three forward. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. And and it's uh, giving back, isn't it? It's yeah. actually ensuring that every time we do a crop, we're actually enhancing it and taking it to another level yeah. rather than rather than taking it backwards. Yeah. And, and you've got to be blue before you can be green, before you can be in the black. <laughs> I just like that. You know, and yeah. I think that's a, um, you know, really to have water in the landscape and be able to hold water um, in your soil um, is the next, it's, it's the first step to being green. Yep, yep. And yep. Then, then to be profitable. Yep. We're losing organic matter. We're losing yep. the capability of our soils to produce. Yeah. And so they end up just being a medium yep. to hold a plant up while we, meanwhile, yes. we're putting artificial fertiliser and artificial, um, you know, means in to prop them up. Yes. Yep. And so that, you know, it's almost like hydroponics in soil um, because we just, we, we're yep. doing everything artificially um, and the soil is just the, the, the means in which the plant can stand up in. There's a real need to really assess the, the costs that um, the, um, the high input farming yeah. um, is, is causing. Well, I think there's, you know, there's a number of aspects. The, the profitability of the dollar side of it is obviously one thing, a very important part of it, but when you, um, when you, you can't unsee that stuff. So once you show them that they're actually, the way they're farming is deteriorating, um, their their asset their their uh, ability to produce in the future and and yeah that 
that's um, confronting for some farmers. Yeah, that whole product has nutrient integrity. Yes. Because there yes. is nothing in our process that has destroyed any of the functionality of any of the microbes, any of the organisms. And so, what farmers can guarantee is nutrient integrity. Integrity. Based on their practices. I like that. February we do our biological monitoring, so I go out and yep. I throw darts, I do the old school dart throwing, oh, yes. um, and I do about 25 dart throws and then I create a percentage about um, the area um, of what I've landed on and I've described the land, you know, the area around the dart and so we, we work on that and then we have, um, so that's February and then by about um, April we are starting to look at our financial plan for the year, yep. so we plan a profit first. Um, there's a, you plan a profit first, you then work out your wealth generating expenses, so anything yep. that's going to grow you, grow yeah. your business, um, and then you look at your um, inescapables, so you really look at what you have to pay, so your rates and yep. things that might end you up in jail if you don't pay, <laughs> um, anything that's legal, yep. um, and then you start looking at your maintaining expenses, and so that's probably where you do a lot of the, the cutting and, yep. and the trimming, um, and then you look forward to then from the, then about May for us April May we are starting to look at our non-growing season plan. Yep. Uh, we expect a frost late April early May, yep. um, and so we need to be aware of you know the shift into yep. that. Uh, and so yeah, we, we do a non-growing season plan, which means we go out and we do a feed budget. We find out how much feed we have in the paddock and how many animals, and make sure that we've got enough feed for the animals we've got. Very good time to then destock if we've got too yes. many animals. Yep. Um, or it might be an opportunity to go, oh, we've got so much feed, let's get some more animals on an adjustment or whatever, or buy or whatever, depending on prices, whatever. Just to make an informed decision. So you can decision. actually make yeah. an informed decision. Yeah. And an early decision. Early yeah. decision is a good decision. Yes. Um, and then um, we carry that through until that, that plan will go through until the next like, season, next summer, uh, which is usually around that November period. Yeah. Um, we're, we're pushing out... Our, um, our summer now is certainly not a spring rain. Yeah. Um, it's definitely in October, November, you know, more November, December now. Um, and so we're making sure that our non-growing season goes extends that far. Yeah. Yeah. Then we'll sit down and do the growing season plan, which is less of a plan in the sense, but it is a minimum maximum. So the ideal there is to actually have cages out in the paddock and actually monitoring the rate of the growth of the grass right. so that we can go in and we put a cage over a plant that a, an animal will graze yep. and um, and then they come in, they graze around that cage and then when they've gone out we monitor how long it takes for the grasses outside the cage to be the oh. same volume, not obviously yep. height because it will be higher, but the same volume of that plant that they would have grazed um, and we then get a rain, we then understand how quickly yep that is growing. So for us, it might be a 30-day um, a recovery to a 60-day recovery. Yeah. So a 30 would be quite quick, a 60 day is a bit slower. And so we might find that that cage is indicating, well, it's a 40-day recovery. Yeah. Okay, so it's in the middle. So we know, then we adjust our graze period, and in the grazing plan, you get a minimum and maximum graze period. Yes. So that you can then adjust your how oh, long. To slow so it might be, it might yeah. be between three days and ten days. Well, if it's about 40, you go, well, I'll go for seven. Yes. I'll be in that paddock for seven days. And so it, it's not an absolute because you've got a growing plant. And the point of the exercise is to minimise overgrazing and it's mm. to maximise the growth and the recovery of the plant yep. within a given time frame. So that's that's a um, you know a basic thing. So those are the sort of the planning um, periods. And making sustainable farming profitable is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, and obviously regenerative farming is is part of that. You could argue about the the wording, whatever, but. Um, no, that's and we work with farmers. I'm getting older and cranky. I don't work with farmers that are um, are stuck in in another uh, a way. But I deal with people who most of the phone calls I get now, more often than not, are I don't know what I need to change. I just know I need to change something. Yeah. And and that's why I'm really interested in in your side of the holistic management and decision making side of it because um, I mean I can do we can help them with the agronomy and the planning and all that sort of things. But often it's the yeah. um, decision making. Well, one of the hardest you alluded to before. One of the hardest things is um, farming and nature is messy, <laughs> and and uh, and I, I struggled with that for a long a long time. Um, coming from mainly a cropping background and you know flat broad acre, the whole paddock's pretty much the same. 
um, but it's not. So a lot of the change comes after they've um, they've realised what's going on that they're they're actually not going to hand their place on in a better condition than they got it. That's a real shock to some people. Um, and yeah, some people will go off on a tangent um, or follow something specific. Um, others will try and educate themselves as best they can and and pick the things that are going to make most likely to make the greatest difference. Mm. It actually makes it interesting. Yes. It's actually yeah. because you every every move you make is an event and you go, oh, what, you know, <laughs> what, well, how's nature going to respond to that event? Yes. You know, and that's yes. exciting, yeah. you know, and, and you go, oh, wow, and the monitoring and looking and all of a sudden you're really watching and seeing and, and engaging yourself back in, back into agriculture and in your landscape. It's, yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah.